Hello? Ah, I've watched people get confused by this all day and then got confused. Um, I work for a company called Forward in uh, London. We do um, search analytics in, um, in the paid search space and we use a lot of the Hadoop ecosystem. Uh, recently, a colleague and I um, added a 0MQ sync um, to Flume so that we could get uh, tap into a real-time stream of our data. So um, we chose 0MQ with Flume. Uh, because we like the look of uh, Zero MQ. Um, so Zero MQ um, is a concurrency framework, but it presents a socket API. It's got nice async uh, I/O threads that it can run. Um, it's got multiple ways of um, sending the transport. So it uses IMPROC, IPC, TCP, and multicast, all with the same API. And actually, uh, you can communicate at the same time. Uh, to the same socket over the different protocols. Um, it's a, a nice um, feature is that it's actually um, one to many or many to many rather than just one to one. Um, it's got an, uh, the range of connection types I'll speak about um, uh, in a moment. And also, it's incredibly easy to use. Um, it's not very well named because it kind of encourages comparison with, say, RabbitMQ or, or ActiveMQ. Um, so it isn't really. Um, to be compared with those things. Uh, it actually has uh, a, another purpose, really, which is, as I say, it's a concurrency framework. So don't think of a, non, a, a queue that's not that reliable. Think in terms of like a super socket, if you like, with a nice asynchronous I.O. back into it. Um, so think concurrency that works. So not, it's message passing concurrency, not, uh, th not, not a thread and shared state uh, concurrency. So you can do message passing concurrency without learning Erlang. Uh, just do it in the uh, language that you like. Um, so there's a couple of connection types. PubSub is a data distribution model. So every subscriber gets all the data that you push onto the channel. Uh, pipeline is a work distribution pattern. So you actually do a round robin through the different uh, pull uh, targets. Uh, request reply is a normal kind of, I ask for something, I get a response. Dealer and route are, are special uh, for routing things and for proxying and, and uh, maybe sending them across different uh, networks, etc. So th because, of, because of this, you can start clients before servers, and they just wait for the servers. You can have clients that are short-lived, long-lived. Long so, you know, as I say, the, the order that you start them is not important. And I say it's really easy to use and nice. So. I hope, and it's, it's very, very worth a, worth a look. It's not just a, an unreliable message queue. It's actually a really nice concurrency framework that's really easy to use in any language. So Flume, you might, you've probably lots of you have heard of, although I did say somebody, hear somebody say yesterday that Flume looks interesting, so perhaps not everybody. It's a Cloudera-created log aggregation tool, so a bit like uh, Scribe, say, that uh, Facebook have got. Um, it's, config, it's got a configurable reliability, so you can get guarantees that what you log is is uh, saved. It has a concept of a source, which is obviously where the data is coming from, a decorator, which transforms the data, and a sync, which is a target for the data. So our problem was we wanted a real-time view on the stuff coming into Flume. We're very happy with ultimately ending up in HDFS and being able to query it with Hive. But several of us wanted, for various reasons, reporting, monitoring, nice graphs and maps pinging up of things, of the transactions that are taking place. Uh, so we wanted a real-time view of it. So we used to actually tail the file systems. So we didn't, it didn't work very well. We found that we would get duplicates or we, we would have problems using uh, popen, uh, calling out from, we are basically a Ruby shop, so calling out by, via popen to Ruby to a script that um, tailed this. And we found it didn't work. And it certainly didn't scale, because every new app needed to do the same thing. And we were grabbing the same files and trying to read from them, et cetera. So we did, our Flume config, that's simple. Um, we had a, a bucket decorator, so it's called an add click this, in this instance. We're tailing this log, and we're sending it to the Flume collector. Uh, here's the uh, work we had to do to implement the Flume sync. So there's three methods you need to write, basically an open, a close, and an append. Uh, so whenever you open in instantiate 0MQ, you need to create a context, a socket of a particular type, and then bind to one of the transports that you're interested in. So here we're taking. TCP connections on uh, port 555 we specified in the config. Uh, the closed one just destroys the, the context and 
or destroys the socket, then terminates the context. Um, so straight away, after we'd implemented this, it only took uh, half a day or so, um, straight away we were tapping into it. And uh, so we sort of sent an email around, by the way, guys, if you do, if you do this, you can access this, this uh, fire hose of all of our data. So straight away people did. So in Ruby, there's a nice binding. You can actually just do the same thing on the other side. Can it create a socket, subscribe to the Flume machine on port 555. Uh, you subscribe to a particular channel, uh, and then you just you just start receiving things, just start looping. So that's really nice. Um, we were curious about how much data was coming through our uh, new fire hose, so another colleague uh, did it in CoffeeScript. So we actually had, within about 20 minutes, about, I think, four different languages consuming this by about eight or nine different, different people, so it was kind of, it was kind of nice. Um, here we've got some aggregation and counting, trying to find out where we got. We actually had 2,000 messages, which is way more than we should have had. So we thought something had gone wrong. It turns out that Flume had started reading from the beginning of the log when we restarted it. So we were getting uh, backdated log information as well. So yeah, we, are, we've typically in, uh, we have about 25,000 load balancer interactions a minute. So that's about 400 a second or 35 million a day. We were actually doing 2,000 a second when Flume restarted, and we are getting this flood of old messages as well. So yeah, it might be web scale, I don't know. Um, it was fast enough for us, and it was quick enough and nice enough for us. What I really liked about it, uh, one of my colleagues has a thing where he talks about uh, Hadoop being very democratic. You've d democratized your data. You, you haven't got uh, data warehousing with some OLAP cube that only c certain people understand. It's actually some, you know, the barrier to entry is somewhat lower. Um, and that you've got one place that all your stuff can go. Um, so now this is kind of similar. We've got one fire hose that's very easy to consume, and I don't know what people might want to do with it, and I don't need to, to think about it necessarily. We've already sent it to Esper, um, the, uh, like a SQL-like query language for operating on unbounded streams. Uh, we're doing some analytics in real time, monitoring stuff, seeing if volumes go up or down. We've got a, a, a map that uh, pings a... a uh, geolocation every time we have a transaction. Um, and we're thinking, because we're in the fire and forget mode of Flume, we may not bother logging stuff, we may not bother tailing logs. And if it's reliable enough across the internet distances, possibly with some firewalling, we're going to try and do zero MQ end to end, maybe. Uh, it's worth an experiment. Um, that's all, really. Some links you might like. Uh, and yeah, where I work is a company called Forward in London. We're hiring, so uh, check us out. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tom.